Chapter 37, Carrie Kelly. Same day, Tuesday, May 28th, and Wednesday, May 29th, 1935. I'm in bed listening to the sound of my mother crying and the deep, even rumble of my father's voice trying to comfort her. The Esther P. Marinoff is a crummy place, a cruel joke. I never did like that, Mr. Purdy. I try to go to sleep, but I keep thinking about Natalie at home in Santa Monica, living her life in the back room of our house and on the steps of Graham's. I rode bikes with Pete, played ball, did my homework. She did not. I will graduate from high school, go to college, get married, have kids. She will not. My mom's done a million things to help Natalie. The aluminum tr treatments, the voodoo dolls, UCLA, the psychiatrist, the Bible readings, Mrs. Kelly. What good were they? Nothing has helped. But suddenly I see this isn't true. One thing has helped, Carrie Kelly. Natalie has been more a part of things here on this island than she ever was before. She's had a life here for the first time, maybe just a little bit of a life, but a life just the same. When I wake up the next morning, I find Mrs. Kelly's number in my mom's phone book. I borrow a nickel from my dad and head down to the phone outside of Mrs. Caconi's. I put the nickel in the coffee can Mrs. Caconi keeps by the phone and tell the operator the number. Mrs. Kelly, I say when the operator signs off. This is Moose Flanagan, Natalie's brother. I'm calling to thank you. You've really helped my sister. Why, dear, I appreciate you saying that. And I wanted to ask you, do you believe the SRP Marinoff will help Natalie? She sighs. Yes, I do. I worked there for five years. I saw kids in proven ways I never saw any place else I've ever been. Natalie wasn't ready in January, but I think she is now. I'd like her to start in June, and I'd like to keep working with her for the first year at least. But unfortunately, Mr. Purdy doesn't agree with me. Is there anything we can do to change his mind? She sighs. I wish I knew. As I explained to your mother last night, I expected her to be accepted. Did her, you know, age? I squeezed the words around the lump in my throat. Hard to say. I, cert I can certainly understand what your mother was up to with that. There's a real bias against older children, and I can't swear I wouldn't have tried the same thing if I were in her shoes. Sometimes with these kids, it's difficult to tell exactly how old they are, but in the case of your sister, I'm afraid it's pretty clear she's at least 14. Yeah, I say in a small voice. I will keep working on this, Moose. I promise you I will, but I, won't to want to give I don't want to give you folks false hope. Yes, ma'am, I say. And Moose, there's something I wanted to tell you too, dear. When Natalie and I were working together, and I see I'm starting to lose her, I always say, what do you think Moose is doing right now? And lately, she's been able to stay with me. She talks about you at school or playing catch or talking with Teresa, and she's able to keep herself with me that way. I thought you might like to know how important you are to her. Yes, ma'am. I wipe the tears off my face. I'm sorry I can't do more. You have no idea how sorry I am. When I hang up the phone, I know I have to do something. Have to. I have no idea what. I wonder if this is how my mother feels, how she always felt. Now I understand. When you love someone, you have to try things, even if they don't make sense to anyone else. After breakfast, I march up the hill to the warden's house. I don't know why I'm going there, except he's the most powerful person I know. If anyone can change this, he can. But the closer I get to the warden's house, the slower my feet go. The warden will be at work in the cell house. If I want to talk to him, I'll have to knock on that door. I stare at the big steel cell house door, unable to move forward or back. My heart beats in my ears and my hands are ice cold. I stay stuck until a voice calls my name. Hey, Moose, what are you doing up there? Aren't you supposed to be in school? I spin around to see Mr. Trixel. He has a cigarette in his mouth and a clipboard in his hand. Sorry, Moose, didn't mean to scare you. What's up? My mind is whirling. What am I doing? What am I doing? Moose. Officer Trix Trixel asks. Uh, yeah, uh, I need to talk to the warden, I say. Can it wait till tonight, son? Officer Trixel takes a long drag from a cigarette. Yes, I mean no, I mutter. Yes, you mean no, which is it? He smiles kindly. No, I say. Officer Trixel grunts. He drops the cigarette out of the on the cement and stamps it out with his foot. Then he buzzes the entry bell. The big steel hinges squeak shrill and sharp as the door opens. Wait here. Officer Trixel says, and the door slams a solid steel closed behind him. I wait a long time, wondering if they've forgotten about me. 
and considering giving up when the cell host door squeaks open again and Officer Trixel and the warden appear. The warden is as neat as ever, like he just came out of the barber shop. He smells of soap and cut grass. Good morning, he says. Good morning, sir, I say. He looks around as if he doesn't know where to sit. He seems to decide on the bench, gives his trousers a tug and sits down. Officer Trixel walks back to the cell house door and stands stiff and straight, not smoking now. So, he folds his hands in his lap. What's this all about, Moose? W w uh, I, uh, I stammer, my forehead suddenly sweaty. I know you know important people in San Francisco. I was just wondering if you might call some of your, you know, friends and maybe they ask Met Esther P. Marinoff to reconsider. Natalie's doing much better. She should have gotten in. Influence? Is that what you're after, son? Yes, sir, I say. I'll give it some thought, but offhand, I can't come up with anyone who might be helpful with this. He sighs and shakes his head. He seems truly sorry. We sit silent for a moment. The warden looks at his watch. Now it's time you were in school. Bet you can make the 8.30 if you run like the dickens. He pats my arm and gets up. Thanks, sir, I say. But you know, I had an idea. He makes a pained noise in his throat. I was thinking, my voice cracks. The idea is crazy, but I can't stop myself. How about Al? Excuse me? The warden asks. I clear my throat and try to say it louder, but it still comes out in a croak. Al Capone? The warden squints his eyes just like Piper does. He makes an annoyed sound and shakes his head. Oh, please don't tell me this is another stunt. No, sir, I'm serious. He's the only one who can do this. Moose, that's nonsense, and I think you know it. I think he could. He sighs a long and labored sigh. First off, that's doubtful. But even if he could, do you really think I'd allow it? I've built this place on fairness, on treating all the convicts the same. If I were to ask Al Capone to do me a favor, what kind of precedent would that be setting? He was sent here because he got preferential treatment in Atlanta ran his empire from prison while the government footed the bill, brought his own furniture, orient oriental rugs, silk underwear, treated him like royalty behind bars. Do you think I want to pave the way for something like that here? It would make a mockery of everything I stand for. I looked directly into his blue eyes. Remember you said, we should think hard about going against the rules. Remember you said that. Well, I have thought hard. The warden meets my gaze. I see that, he says, but in this case, you're asking me to bend the rules, and I'm not about to. You may think it's the right thing to do, but I do not. You don't have to give him anything. Just ask him. What's the harm of asking, sir? The warden takes a deep breath. <sighs> Look, Moose, you want to help your sister, and that's admirable, but I can't help you with this. Your parents will work something out. Now run along. Run along? Run along? He can't tell me to act like an adult one moment and treat me like a kid the next. This makes me so furious. My mouth shoots off before I can stop it. You didn't mean it, did you, sir? It was just a speech. You don't really want us to think you want us. You don't really want us to think you want us to obey. I can see the anger flash through the warden's eyes. He takes his foot off the bench and stands straight. I know you and your family have been through a lot, so I'm going to ignore that comment. But if you speak to me like that again, I will have you and your family off the island in a blink of an eye. Do you understand me? Yes, sir, I say, my whole body trembling. He continues to stare, then seems to decide. I've gotten his point. He sighs and crosses his arms. Look, son, it isn't that easy. The world isn't going to kiss your boots because you learn to think. You have your answers. It's no. Now, if you'll excuse me, I have things to do.